Happy Sunday, everyone, and welcome to another episode right here on Lexan TV. This week's episode will feature live champion Dustin Reynolds. Dustin is known to everyone all over the world as the single-handed sailor. And what makes it more interesting is that Dustin is actually a single-handed sailor. Dustin is a double amputee who has defied so many odds in his life, got up from a really dark place, and he decided to live, to live for the love of sailing. This is my conversation with Dustin Reynolds, the single-handed sailor. Enjoy. This is a lovely episode. I'm so excited to connect with this gentleman right here on Lexan TV. And you know, for this episode, it's all about what I've dubbed life champion. And I've got a true life champion with me today. He so graciously accepted to, you know, just have this conversation from all the way in Panama. And I'm happy to say that he is here to share his story with me and with you. I'd like to say uh, aloha and welcome <laughs> to Dustin. Dustin is known as the single, is it single arm sailor? The single-handed sailor. Single-handed yeah, no, sailor. Yeah. And, and I've learned, Dustin, welcome again. I've learned that it has absolutely nothing to do with your story. It's actually a term. It is, yeah. So single-handed sailing is a term for sailing by yourself. Yeah. And, um, but then I'm also sailing by myself with one arm. So. That's right. And Dustin, you have quite an interesting story to share. And I think what attracted me to your story and for you to share your story is the fact that you're doing all of this as a double amputee. And, you know, sometimes in life, sometimes even folks who have all their limbs tend to complain about this, complain about that. And then you, you see Dustin, we see you and we're like, what the hell am I complaining about? You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, well, my life is pretty good. So I don't really have much that's, to complain that's, about either. Yeah. And I, and I absolutely, I must say, I absolutely love your spirit. I really love your spirit. So Dustin, let's, let's start from the beginning. You know, um, I understand this. This was not an accident. It, it was actually, initially when we met, I thought you had an accident but you were actually involved in an accident. It was a hit and run by a drunk driver. Share, uh, and if you can, reflect on that incident for us, please. Yeah, so this was back in Hawaii in 2008, and um, I was just on my way home one night, and uh, a drunk driver in a big lifted Chevy Silverado truck uh, swerved into my own lane and hit me head on. And I was on a RC51 motorcycle, Wow. The uh, it looked like he was trying to hit me. We were on a straightaway, and he just swerved straight at me, like as if it was intentional. Um, he, the wheel came off his truck, so he went about another six hundred meters after hitting me and drove into a ditch. And um, he was incredibly drunk. He blew a point two eight. I mean, it's likely he woke up in jail and had no idea why he was there. Um, yeah. So for me, I uh, I came to on the side of the road, and um, I didn't remember the collision. I, I remembered seeing the truck come at me and uh, I was trying to take my helmet off and figure out where I was and what was going on. It was almost like I woke up in my own bed and um, I couldn't figure out why my other hand wasn't helping take my helmet off. And I reached over and I grabbed like this cold, wet, bloody stump. You know, I could feel the dirt and bone. And uh, I realized then I was just like, OK, that that truck hit me. You know, I, I kind of pieced together what happened. And then uh yeah, I screamed for help a few times. There was nobody there. And then I called 911 and told them where I was. My phone thankfully survived the accident. So it was still in my pocket. And uh, yeah, my foot was really badly damaged. So I couldn't stand. Um, it was still there, but was later amputated. Yeah. Wow. Did this individual, I mean, clearly after the moment you, you discovered and everyone discovered that he was indeed highly intoxicated. I mean, did he... Did he come to you during that period? So, yeah. So about two minutes into my, was it two, yeah, two minutes into my 911 call, he walked up. He said he had heard me screaming and he denied hitting me and um, said that there was this other car that hit me or something. But it, uh, I mean, it was obvious, you know, there's blood all over his truck and the wheel was gone. Like it, you know, it was obvious it was him, but I, I still think it's likely he didn't realize it. 
like he you know like i said he was so drunk like it's there's a chance he just like came to in his truck and you know he might have fallen asleep at the wheel or who knows yeah yeah wow tell me about the moment you you arrived at the hospital what would you say was the toughest part of recovery and the interesting thing is dustin based on on um your story previously that I would have reviewed before, I, I think the most amazing thing was your will to live. You you were basically given a 50-50 chance, weren't you? Oh, not even that. Um, so when I was on the side of the road, just before I called 911, I thought about it because I, I knew how badly damaged I was and I knew it was going to be a really long recovery time. And so I paused before hitting send on my phone because I was like, uh, do I really want to make this call right now? Or do I just want to lay here and let it end? And obviously I called, but when I was in the hospital, the, uh, you know, the doctors were, they gave me a CT scan and it didn't really show anything because, uh, you know, I had so much internal bleeding, like they couldn't really see what was going on, but they knew I had a punctured lung and I aspirated. So I vomited into my lungs and they said, I mean, that by itself is a 50, 50 survival rate. And um, so the doctors gave me the opportunity because I, you know, I called my mom and my dad and my grandpa. And I had at that point, I had maybe six or eight friends in the hospital there with me. And um, yeah, so the doctor was like, you know, do you want to just stay up with your friends? He said, going under anesthesia right now with the aspiration and your current condition, it's like, it's really unlikely that you'll survive. And so I was actually presented the opportunity of whether to die in the hospital. And I told him, I was like, no, you know, I'm, I made this decision when I called you and uh, I'm going to live and here I am. Wow. <laughs> Superman. <laughs> that listen, I, you really have to find it deep in you, you know, at that moment to, to want to, you know, you know, that saying when they say it's mind over matter and, and this is no, this is no small matter, mind you, but um, you just, you knew you wanted to live. You had a lot to live for. And we're going to get to that in a few minutes. Um, tell me about the recovery process for you, Dustin. You know, now you're a double amputee because you also lost your leg. It's not just the arm. And what was recovery like for you? What was that period like for you? Therapy, physio, what was it like for you? The recovery was tough um, because it was an automobile accident. In Hawaii, is a no-fault state, and so it's something where people are allowed to carry really low limits of liability insurance. And so my health insurance decided, like, because the accident wasn't my fault, it wasn't their responsibility to pay for anything. And so they were just denying everything, anything related to the accident they didn't want to pay for. And um, so it was really difficult to get medical care. I even, right when I first got out of the hospital, I was on blood thinners. And so I was required to get like three blood draws a day or three blood draws a week to adjust my medication. And it's, you know, potentially fatal if you screw up on the medication. If your blood gets too thin, you bleed internally and die. If it gets too thick, it knocks the blood clots loose and goes to your heart, or your lungs, or your brain, and you potentially die from that as well. And um, I go to the doctor to get this done. And they said, no, you know, you have to pay cash up front. It's going to be $200 per blood draw. And I'm like, I can't afford that. You know, I'm not working. I, you know. So I started going to the emergency room just to get my blood draws. Yeah. Um, and my insurance did end up paying for all this, but they, at the end, they put a half a million dollar lien on me. So my own health insurance company came down to me for half a million dollars. And so through this process, you know, I think that the health insurance knew they weren't going to, you know, get their money back and, you know, eventually I wasn't going to be a customer anymore. So they were just trying to deny everything. And so getting prosthetics was incredibly difficult. Any sort of physio, like they, I think they approved, it was something like six hours of physical therapy for missing an arm and a leg. And uh, so like getting physical therapy, you know, I got six hours of it. Um, yeah, it was really, really difficult just getting yeah. anything done. I mean, everything was slow. Like I'd break a prosthetic and it would take the insurance like two or three months to approve a new one. And right. um, so it'd be two or three months in a wheelchair waiting for a new prosthetic. And yeah, it was, oh. it was tougher than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. And eventually I got a reconstructive surgery done on my leg about, you know, three years later. And um, that really helped with wearing prosthetics. I started getting stronger at that point. And um, I did a bankruptcy. I did an offer and compromise with the IRS that I had an $80,000 tax debt because I didn't pay my taxes that year. And um, 
so I got all that paid for. Uh, yeah. And then just about four years later, it was finally like, what do I do now with my life? Yeah. And speaking of everything that you've been through, I mean, I must ask you, where, where do you get your strength from? I mean, there's a lot of strength we're talking about here, not just physically, but, you know, just yeah. mentally and psychologically. Where do you get it from? Honestly, it was all the community around me. Because yeah. every time the medical insurance denied me or the IRS came down on me and my accountant worked for free to help me out with my IRS debt. Um, I had a doctor that would meet me after hours because he didn't take my insurance. So he'd just like meet me at the bar and write prescriptions and try to help me out. Yeah. Um, you know, I had three lawyers work pro bono. Um, all my friends, you know, everybody was there. Like, so anytime I really thought I was down and out, there was, there was a helping hand. And so it, uh, it was difficult for myself as well. It was also difficult in my whole community, but like with everyone pulling together, it wasn't just me. It's like everybody was going through it as well and helping out. Yeah. It's so important to have a, you know, support system and that in itself, you know, really uplifts you. It's incredible. Yeah. It really is incredible. Um, the hike to the Golden Falls was really incredible. I really enjoyed that. Um, and the Sundays at the Hog Island, you know, that was always a fun time with the music over there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I love Grenada. You're watching this week's episode of Life Champion. We'll be right back after this. Introducing Color by Sissons. 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 Fast forward a few years well down the road and light bulb moment. I mean, you've never, you've never sailed before. Where did the interest of sailing pop into your head, Dustin? <laughs> what caused this? What sparked this? So pretty much that moment where I became debt free, when I made that last payment to the IRS, um, I was trying to figure out what to do with my life. And I had two, I had a carpet cleaning business and a fishing boat. And both of them at that point were like four years out of maintenance. Um, I didn't have any cash or credit because I had just gone bankrupt. So I had no way to reinvest in the companies. Um, my carpet cleaning van needed to be replaced at the time of the accident. And now four years later, it was just completely falling apart. And I tried working a little bit and fishing a little bit, but things kept breaking down and I wasn't making any money. So I started looking for other jobs to do or something to do. And um, randomly, I came across a website called the slocumsociety.com. It was all people who had set a record sailing around the world alone. Right. And I was like, well, there's no double amputee on there. I'm going to do that. And uh, so I sold the business and the fishing boat collectively for $12,000 and bought a $12,000 sailboat. And I learned to sail off of YouTube and books. And wow. I spent about one year working on the boat and learning to sail. And um, yeah, and then I left. Wow. You literally just said you learn to sail from YouTube and books. Okay, let, let's talk about how challenging that must have been, <laughs> though, because you're literally a one-man army. You're a one-man team on your yacht doing <laughs> your thing. Let's, let's talk, or you, ex explain to me how, how challenging. I'm just trying to picture this, Dustin. You're, you're, you're something else, man. You're... <laughs> Describe to me the first couple of sessions. You're on your yacht. You're literally trying to maneuver everything solo. Share some of those moments that you had some really tough times. So my first trip, like the, when I first bought the boat, the previous owner sailed with me from Oahu to the Big Island, which is right. about a 24-hour trip. Um, and I was hoping to learn a bit about sailing from him, but it was straight downwind. We only used the head sail. And... Wow. Um, so I didn't really pick up too much, you know, from him on that. And the boat was an absolute wreck. It was a $12,000 sailboat. So <laughs> there was tons of things that needed to be fixed. So over the year, I was basically just fixing everything and not learning how to sail. And eventually 
And, you know, I told my friends and family that I knew how to sail. Like, I, I didn't mean to be dishonest, but I didn't want to worry them either. And so my roommate decides he wants to come sailing with me and, like, learn to sail. And so we did, like, a one-month trip around the Hawaiian Islands. And it was funny because he looked up the YouTube channel one day and he sees all these, like, instructional sailing videos. And he looks at me, he's like, you don't know how to sail, do you? I was like, well, you know, I do now. I watch the videos. <laughs> Busted, right? You were busted. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> leaving Hawaii, so my first time ever sailing alone was from Hawaii to Palmyra, which is a, about a 1,200-mile trip. Right. And um, so, like, I'm having this going away kind of party on the dock, and everyone's helping, it, like, do the last finishing touches. And my roommate, like, bought all the food and fuel because I'd run out of money at this point as well. And... um but we're trying to cut the goodbyes short. We don't want like too many tears or too much lingering. Right. So <laughs> everyone takes off and leaves me by myself and I have to like untie the boat by myself and get ready to go. And I was like, Oh crap. No, there's no, no one even there to like shove me off the dock. And uh, <laughs> I narrowly missed this fishing boat coming out, you know, cause I have to push the boat, jump on there and then yes. you know, throttle out of there. And um, so I get outside the Harbor and there's no wind and I'm completely exhausted. I've been up like for a day and a half, just getting all the final preparations done. And I motored out about, you know, an hour and then turned it off and just went to sleep and slept for like two or three hours. And when I woke up, it was beautiful out, you know, I was coming down the coast and I was kind of keeping the tether of my cell phone because I was staying close enough that I'd be in cell phone range, you know, cause that, as soon as I left that range, I had no communication with the outside world. Yeah. So then I was truly on my own. And so I was calling friends and family like the whole way down the coast. And then just right as I left South Point, the squall hit, you know, so it's like this little small storm and I had to go and reduce the sails and I came back and there's no cell phone coverage. And I'm just like, <gasps> you know, oh I'm by myself, goodness. you know? And okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. What, what kind, how mm -hmm. would you describe your feeling? How, how, Describe the emotion for me, that, that first moment you went out, you're there, you're one with the wind and the, and the mm -hmm. nature and everything and the ocean. Describe that feeling. It, uh, the first day was, uh, was a, like I said, it was more or less like having this disconnection from like all my friends and community and everything. And, yeah. I mean, there was definitely some second thoughts. Uh, it was pretty rough. Um, so like it was rougher conditions than I would have ever taken my fishing boat out in, you know, it's probably yeah. about two meter seas and 25 knots of wind. And, and, uh, but you know, the sailboat was handling it fine and sailing perfectly. Okay. And, uh, so I was just kind of taking it in. And, but then also, like I said, the Hawaii community just was so close and always there. And to leave that behind was probably the most difficult part. Yeah. And, but after the first couple of days, you know, you kind of get into this routine at sea and it, it was really neat. It, uh, I think spending like 10 days at sea by yourself is one of the most therapeutic things somebody could do. You know, it's just, yeah. you don't have any internet, you don't have any conversations with people. It's almost like 10 days of just meditation and self-reflection. And um, by the time I got to Palmyra, like I, I felt like I went through something and, you know, was a more complete person at that time. Wow, that's incredible. That is incredible. How many uh, territories, islands, countries have you visited within your space of time with traveling, Dustin? Off the top. So in the it's been seven years, uh, almost seven years. June will make seven years I've been gone. I've been to 35 countries and every continent except Europe. I even sailed to Antarctica. And um, so, yeah, it's been amazing. And everywhere, like, I've had just the warmest welcome everywhere that I've gone. I've never really had any problems whatsoever. Yeah. So. yeah. And your latest quest. You're in Panama. And I know you have the Panama Canal on your to-do list. Yeah. Yeah, this is exciting. So I'm almost home, you know. So I'm almost finished with my solo circumnavigation. Um, as soon as I get through the Panama Canal, which will be the only part of my journey with crew, and uh, I have a few friends flying in from Alaska that are going to come through the canal with me, which will be amazing. Nice. So at least I'll like this, these will be the only miles towards Hawaii that I'll have crew in the whole trip. And so it'll be really cool to share that with friends. Awesome. And, yeah. That is awesome. Folks listening to your conversation and essentially I reach I reach viewers worldwide, but 
more so very homegrown, the homegrown audience. What mm-hmm. sort of, because, you know, I know of individuals who would not have experienced exactly what you've experienced, but who may be going through challenges based on um, losing a limb, that sort of thing. What sort of message would you like to leave with persons who might be going through what you went through um, when it comes to dealing with everything, you know, at hand? What would you like to to tell them? Yeah, I would, I mean, I would say there's always an opportunity for something better. And um, I told my dad at the time of my accident, he was incredibly angry at the person that hit me and wanted revenge. And like, he was like speaking really negatively about it. And I, you know, of course, you know, he's upset. And um, I told him at that time, I was like, you know, dad, it's like, I'll never know if this will be a positive or negative change in my life. Because right now I have no idea what, who I would have been had this not happened to me. But going through this trauma, you know, got me a deeper connection with my community and people around me. And it's also presented this opportunity of what I'm doing now. So even though losing an arm and a leg could be a giant pain in the butt sometimes, uh, it's also presented me a new opportunity. And I think potentially my life is better now than it would have been had it not happened. Yeah. Your story is such an incredible one. I'm, I'm into movies. I love movies. So if it were to do a movie, who would you want to play you? Oh, who would I want to play me? <laughs> Gosh, Sandra Bullock. <laughs> no way! You said Sandra Bullock! <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It doesn't have to be. I like that. Right? <laughs> okay, okay, Dustin. Now, to be, to be completely fair, no, I love Sandra Bullock. She's, she's a bad one. Yeah. But if you had yeah. to choose a male, an actor, who would you choose? I would probably choose, uh, what's his name? That guy from Guardians of the Galaxy, Chris Ah. uh, something. He seems really cool. And I've heard a few radio interviews with him. He seems like a really nice guy. So I think that would probably be my choice. Two good choices there, man. They would not disappoint (laughs) you. I can tell you that. (laughs) I can tell you that. And finally, um, I know we would have met, and that's how we met. You came to Grenada. Mm -hmm. I am, I am curious to find out what would you say was one of your most memorable moments or what was most unforgettable time when you stopped off right here in Grenada? Um, the hike to the Golden Falls was really incredible. I re- really enjoyed that. Um, and the Sundays at the Hog Island, you know, that was always a fun time with the music over there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I loved Grenada. And I rented a scooter there for, you know, a couple of weeks and just rode all over the island and yeah. I just, yeah, I, it's a special place. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. And I've, I have to say for the record that a lot of folks are probably going to reach out to me after I say this, but Dustin, you came to Grenada and you went to the falls, the Golden Falls in particular. Yeah. And I've never been. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you should go. It's so, amazing. <laughs> I need to catch up with you now. I need to catch yeah, up yeah. with you. But I, I'm so happy that we connected. I want to say a special shout out to the management and staff at Budget Marine and True Blue, because of course, that is where we met Dustin. And I know we had a great conversation and here we are. And thank you so much again for accepting my invitation to share your story with the viewers of Lexan TV. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really appreciate the conversation. It was fun. Thank you so much again, and you're welcome. And just keep pushing on, folks. If you need to find out more about Dustin, he has his official, I know you have your Facebook page, uh, The Single-Handed Sailor. Check out some of Dustin's extraordinary trips all over the world. Well, excluding Europe, right, Dustin? (laughs) (laughs) But we know you're going to be adding that to your list pretty soon. All the best with your trip to uh, the... uh, Panama Canal. Have good fun and we will be in touch. All the best and keep inspiring, man. All right. Cheers. Aloha. Thank you so much. Aloha. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Welcome, everyone. I'm Lexan Fletcher, and this is Lexan TV. Now, the Lexan TV platform is home to many great series. There's a Life Champion series, and of course, General Lifestyle. You know, this is a career. This is not just about storytelling. It is a true passion. Keep doing what you love to do. I have never chased after money. You want to leave this world having made a contribution. But don't forget, there's also food and cuisine. So there's the We Cook In series as well. I like to cook the curry. And coming soon the life balance podcast i'm really excited about that one thank you so much for stopping by remember to click like 
share, and on our YouTube channel, subscribe today. Welcome back. Thank you so much again for tuning in to this week's episode. Of course, it featured life champion Dustin Reynolds. Now, if you need to find out more about Dustin and his incredible journey, you can check out his Facebook page, The Single Handed Sailor. Enjoy this week's episode. Don't be shy. Let me know in the comment section below. And of course, hop on over to YouTube as well. See what's cooking on that side and subscribe today. Don't forget to share the love, to share the page, to share the links. Before I get out of here and leave you to enjoy the rest of your Sunday, I've got a big announcement to make. Yes, the trivia question. I posted a question a couple of days ago and this one was a big one. We wanted someone to get the opportunity to be the next guest taster on the next week cooking episode. And we have a lovely lady who was quick on the trigger finger. <laughs> Miss Mahiva Strawn Nelson, congratulations to you, my dear. She was pretty quick. I know there was someone right behind her, right behind her. She was a few seconds before. She did answer the question correctly. Uh, Canadian-born actor Brandon J. McLaren's dad is from Granville. So there you have it. And congratulations again. And for those of you who are wondering if this is the end, it's not the end. There's going to be lots more opportunities for you or your friend or a friend of a friend to appear on the Lexan TV platform, in particular as a guest taster for a week again. Don't forget to stay tuned for much more updates. We've got Mother's Day right around the corner. So that only means one thing. We've got a great promotion coming up. It could be your mama that might be our next winner on Lexan TV. So until next time, have a fantastic week and do stay tuned to the updates on the page. And again, for those of you who just tuned in, joined, liked, shared, thank you. God bless. Bye-bye.